Well, praise the Lord this morning. I just love the Holy Spirit, don't you? Let's, let's give the Holy Spirit a hand of thanksgiving for being here and directing us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, we enjoy you, and we trust you. In the name of Christ, you may be seated. God bless you for being here this morning. And I want you to know that this is a great day in the kingdom of the Lord. We've already had an, an experience with the Holy Spirit, and I don't, I know about you. I start to say I don't know about you, but I know that I, in turn, let the Holy Spirit burn off some stuff that I needed burning off this morning, and, and he did. He just took it and just burned it off, and I am so thankful for that. Welcome to those of you who are with us as our guests. We're so glad that you're here, and um, this morning I want to speak to you about faith fundamentals. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a good one to start with. Amen. I can do all things. Faith fundamentals. But I want to talk to you, you know, in the sports events, and there are many of them, I don't know why the TV is constantly filled with them, but at every sports event they have a halftime or a place where they always meet the coach at halftime and they usually get to the coach that's not winning. And they always say, what are you going to do in the second half? What are you going to do differently? And they always say the same thing. Well, you know, if it's football, we got to tackle better. we got to block better. we got to run the ball better. And, you know, like you expect some revelation. But it's back to what he's saying is back to the fundamentals. I am told that Vince Lombardi, the famous coach and legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers during its great days, would start every year as he would gather his team together and hold up a football and say, this is a football. It's made out of leather. It weighs so much. It has so many laces. And begin at the very basic of the fundamentals. You know, if you ask somebody, sometimes I remember as a boy, they'd say, you know, well, I'm really struggling with something as a Christian. And they'd say, well, brother, you just got to pray more. You just got to spend more time in the Word. You, gotta ju you just got to just gotta believe God. And you know, you think, well, I know that, but uh, what else can I do? Well, they always, even Jesus himself, when, when they kept asking him all kinds of questions, well, what about what happens if, my, if a, a man dies and his, you know, his, his brother marries and he dies and all kinds of questions. And finally, Jesus just said, let me make it simple. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And that's, that's the fundamentals, that's the principle on which everything the law is built upon. Well, you know, when you start with fundamentals, you always start with why. What is the purpose for anything? And when we ask the purpose, it begins to show us what are the fundamentals. For example, when we look at the purpose for creation. And we are again reminded, I'm going to remind you of things today that you already know, but it's time to go back, I felt, this week, to go back some of the fundamentals of why we're here and what we're here to, to receive and accomplish. And I think the Holy Spirit's already set the table. Can you hear an amen this morning? He's already set the table for us to enjoy the time of celebration with Him. But God had a desire to have a family and he needed a vessel to put that love into because you see, God is love, but it's not any kind of love. It's an agape love, which much give of itself. So he needed a, a, a family to pour it into. And the word that comes to me is the word devotion. He wanted a family that he was devoted to the family, and we in turn were devoted back to him. So he had to put himself, but the glue of all of this is love. Love is the glue, and that's what we've celebrated already in communion. But you know, to make it work, he had to give us a choice in order that we could reciprocate. It's not a one-way, it's a two-way love. And, uh, and out of that, when man failed, the Lord allowed resistance to come in or to be present or the opportunity to make a choice. You can choose to receive what he offers or you can choose not to. And out of that, there began a, a warfare, if you will, a competition for your soul. The enemy is competing for your soul. 
And the Lord is competing for your soul. So there's what we call warfare. And let me make a statement to you. There will always be competition and warfare in your life. Until Jesus comes, until you die. Now, that doesn't be, that is not a defeating statement. Because as you see, we have been prepared to overcome. But you will have to war in this life to overcome whatever it is that the enemy will bring against you. Now, much of the Bible is about that warfare. From the very beginning, it's about warfare. And at the end of the revelation, it's about warfare and how to win the warfare. Now, that's a fundamental. And sometimes we just want, you know, the devil to go away and leave us alone. And, and, uh, and I wish she would, but he won't. The devil is, I will not, I don't like to compliment him in any way, but there is a persistence about the devil. And, uh, and sometimes we have to be reminded of that. But when he created man and woman and put them in the garden, he gave them authority. Authority over everything, actually. The animals and the plants and everything was under their authority. And the part of this that made it work is God made a covenant with them. And in his covenant, he said, if you will do this, and that's eat of the tree of life, and not do that, which is eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you will do just simply that, then you will have my presence, and you will have this delegated authority. But your part is to believe me. That's called faith. If you believe me and respond to me and act upon what I've said, then that is faith. If you believe that if you eat of the right tree, you'll have light, and if you believe you eat of the wrong tree, you will have death, then that's faith to believe that what I'm saying is true. Now that's fundamental. That's basic. God said it, we got to believe it. And so we, we, he began to give them the authority through his covenant. Now man gave up his authority, we know that, and uh, he did it through doubt. The greatest weapon that the enemy has is doubt. I was reading this week a long article about the fact about our young people, our young children, teenagers, and those that go off, that the enemy brings into them constantly doubt. He can build up doubt in them. And it, it, there has always been a lot of Doubt we have to overcome, but he is always using that. So after man gave up his authority, all hell broke loose. I mean, hell came up to fight against us. How many of you will say this with me before going further? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, right? So he gave up, and, and the greatest warfare began to start right then. Now, God, man's faith in God is his authority. That's where we get our authority. In the beginning, as I said, the faith had to be there for man and woman in the garden to be able to operate in that authority. They had to believe that that delegated authority was theirs by God, and they believed it. That's faith. They believed it. They trusted in it. They believed it that it is and was. And, and then after that, after man failed, there had to be another way to put and recognize that authority in God. And the authority figure or point of reference that the Lord gave was sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice, and through the fact that recognizing that sacrifice was a point of faith, that believing, if I believe in that sacrifice, I will have the authority from the Father. That I have to believe it, and there had to be some bloodshed in that sacrifice, but when there was bloodshed, the, they believed that if you believed that that blood was the remission for their sins, and the restoration of their relationship back with the Father, then that sacrifice was served in the faith of the sacrifice would restore that authority. How many of you agree with me on that? Thank you for those that did. I appreciate that. I need all the help this morning. 
And so there was after that, the generations to come, that covenant relationship continued on believing that if there is a sacrifice, and I believe that sacrifice restores my faith and relationship with the Father, I can have the authority, the forgiveness of my sins, and I can have the authority to represent Him on earth. So this became the way of recognizing by faith. As the point of reference in the very beginning was a tree of life, and now it was a sacrifice of the animals that had to be sacrificed by shedding blood, and it was all set up for you and me as we moved forward. Because you see, at that point, the authority shifted and shared. The authority shifted and shared in the sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice in order by faith to believe that that sacrifice represented the blood shed and through that I would be restored back with the authority that I originally have. So the second Adam made a sacrifice, a love sacrifice. He demonstrated and the glue of it was the love that drove him to the cross which we, were rep which we represented this morning when we received communion. We did that because we believe that if we believe in that sacrifice, amen? amen? We believe if we believe in that sacrifice that it was sufficient for all of our sins and I believe that my point of faith is that if I believe that I can be saved and restored back to the full authority that they had in the garden. That's full restoration. When all things are restored, yes, when all things are restored, Jesus is coming back and the restoration will be that I believe by faith in that sacrifice that it is. Now we know that when we look at the fundamentals, and that is the subject this morning, the fundamentals, there are really five fundamentals that I'm going to mismention them. I won't, each one of them could be a whole sermon within itself. But we call these of the Christian faith the five fundamentals. The first one is the Trinity. We believe there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. That they're one God, but they're three functions. They're one in three and three in one. And can I explain all that to you? No. If I could, I'd be God. But you see, there is one God, but He has three parts, three functions. And those three functions we call the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The second thing is we must believe in Jesus. Jesus as a sacrifice, since the point of our faith and redemption and authority is in the sacrifice, we must believe that God put himself in the form of man, came to earth, took on the form of man, resisted every temptation that could possibly be brought against him, and was there in, in all of his kindness and love, but also his righteousness. You see, Jesus is a demonstration that you can be righteous, kind, and generous, and loving, and also be righteous. There's no compromise in Jesus. But yet he, had, he, he spent time with the prostitutes. He spent time with the, the, the thieves, the tax collectors they were called. He spent time, but he, did, he, he held the line of righteousness regardless. And so we begin to see that we must believe in Jesus. Matter of fact, he is the only way because he is the satisfying sacrifice that the Father accepts. And then we go to the resurrection as again Dr. Mary was bringing to this redemption this morning is through the resurrected power of Jesus that he didn't stay in the grave. That if he had died and stayed in the grave he'd have been another man. But you see that the power of the, of the Father reached down that resurrection power and snatched him right out of the grave and brought him and restored him back to himself going through hell first. Amen. We're talking about the work of the Holy Ghost here this morning. He did this through the Father. Then we must believe in salvation, that the blood atonement is necessary, that we must appropriate the work of Jesus that he did on the cross. We must believe that that was a sacrifice that works for you and for me. How many of you this morning have trusted in that sacrifice of the blood of Jesus? Amen. If you haven't, we need to get you saved this morning because that's, that's what saves you is the blood of Jesus receiving His work. And then the other is the Holy Scriptures. Those are the five things that are fundamental to Christianity. We just believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the Scripture, that it was written under the, uh, under the authorship and the, 
direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that then when these words were penned, they were penned not by man alone, but by man and the Holy Spirit, and they're without error. And everything that we need to walk out our Christian faith and to walk out the Christian life is in the Bible. How many of you believe that? Okay, well, we must be all of us onto the fundamentals then. What we believe is a fundamental belief. Now, let's take it a little bit further because you see at that point it begins to separate into many different beliefs. Those are the fundamental beliefs and then some believe that miracles are for today and miracles are not for today. And let me tell you, you wonder why. You see, man is supposed to walk in miraculous anointing of the Holy Spirit. We, we should be able to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We should be able to call out demons and they will go. We should be able to do those things that Jesus did. We should be able to. And you say, well, why can't we? I'll tell you why. Because there's so much unbelief and doubt in the church. There's so many pastors and preachers that preach against it that it's not for today, that that's a good thing. And if God would want to do it, God can do it. But we as his people cannot call upon the authority of the Holy Spirit. And so we create our own, we, begin, we are our own enemies, as they say. We sabotage ourselves because our own meaning, ourselves meaning the body of Christ. It's just like when Jesus went to his hometown, he couldn't do miracles because there was doubt and unbelief. And let me tell you, there's so much doubt and unbelief in church, and that's because the church doesn't want to be challenged. The church doesn't want to have to lay hands on the sick and maybe they may not recover. Oh my, what have I done? Have I discredited the Lord? No, you do it and you do it and you do it. Wait a minute, I'm taking off in a different direction. I'm going to get back. <laughs> All right, he, then we have this empowerment by the Jesus to his disciples. Now let me say something, that Jesus, when he was on earth, he healed all manner of sickness and disease. He called out devils. He raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. He, there was any innumerable acts of, of deliverance that he did. He did all of the works of the, uh, the, against Satan. He controlled the elements. He, walk, he stopped the storm. He walked on the water. He multiplied food. He restored everything that needed to be restored, everything, even a severed ear that Peter cut off. He turned the water into wine. He accomplished everything that he undertook to do. Jesus did everything that the Lord told him to do. He said, I do whatever the Father says. I do it. That's total faith in the Father. And so he, this is the surprising thing, and this is where the, we begin to talk about what we believe here at the Life Center is fundamental. And we said in Matthew 10, let's look at that, for example. He said there in the first verse, Matthew 10, 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Yes, he invoked that power to the disciples. And you say, well, that was for the disciples, not for the church after that. Let me tell you, they, they went on and on and on and on and there have been miracles after that. And in the 17th chapter of John, where Jesus said, not for these alone, but those that will follow after them. They are the ones that have been empowered with this gift. Of every gift that I have, that has been empowered through the disciples. And so he says, well, we, let's go on. Then he said, and you go preach. Who, me? You go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. And so we begin to see in Luke 10, it's the same thing. He sent them out two by two. Seventy of them went out. And they said they came back and they were all excited. And they said, we laid hands on the sick and they recovered. We cast out demons and they had to leave. We did all of those things that you said we could do. And we did it. And Jesus said, well, don't, you know, let's just begin with the fundamentals. Be glad that your name is written in the kingdom up in the heavenly scroll. Just be glad you're saved. And then because it's out of that power that you can do all of these things. He talked, let's go to John 14. We love this, 12. More surely I say to you, he that believeth in me the works that I do, he will do also. Who is he talking to here? 
Is he talking to you? Is he talking to me? I, that's what the Word says. The words that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Say greater work. Say it again. We're a greater one. All right. Then he goes on. And then he says, not only that, he's given us all kinds of gifts. It's interesting, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gift, the words of wisdom. He said you have words of knowledge, discerning of spirits, diverse tongues, interpretation of the tongue. And, and these are the gifts that we've given, but not only has he given us gifts, but he's also given us Weapons to fight with because I said we're in a warfare. And it, but you know every weapon and every gift that you have must be exercised and built up. We're all given, given a measure of everything. It says in Ephesians 4 that we've been given a measure of grace. We've been given a measure of faith. If you didn't get a measure you couldn't get saved. You have to have a measure of faith to draw you by the Holy Spirit to receive that gift that He's offered you. But we all have a seed deposited in us, but as we exercise that muscle, that seed, it begins to grow, and it grows, and it grows, and becomes more powerful. And after a while, you're operating in the spirit world and not in the natural world. Because by faith, you transition into that place where the Lord Jesus operated. So we've been given... The tools, it's interesting, you know, we just had the Lord's table this morning. And many of our good brethren, they, get, they love 1 Corinthians 11 where they have the Lord's table, you know. And it was almost as we did this morning. They took the, blood, the, the wine and it representing the blood and the bread representing the body. And they love that and then they get to 1 Corinthians 12 and they just skip over that. Where it talks about speaking in tongues, where it talks about the gift, where it talks about those things, they just suddenly go over to, they say, well, we're going to go to 13 and talk about love. <laughs> they go to the love chapter and skip the power chapter. But let me tell you, church, we're coming into a time when you're going to see the power restored. We're coming into a time when it's going to be taken up. It's going to happen. Let me tell you, people are ready, ready, ready. I was talking to a young man in the gym. He said, you know, I go to this church and it's been wonderful for my children, but there's got to be more. I said, brother, you are right. Let me help you with that. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, there, there, there is more, but we're coming into more. I don't know whether you all know it, but the Southern Baptist Convention said that they do believe that tongues may be for today. Now, they, they picked a fight when they did that. But let me tell you, you can't ignore a lot of the Scripture. It is there, and either it is not there, it's there for a reason. And if it was written that there is power gifts and there are weapons to use, then let's get on with using them because we got a warfare out there. We got a, the enemy's active today. He's determined to take our freedom. He's determined to take our heritage. He's determined to take what God's given us, and it rightfully belongs to the church and the kingdom of God and it's ours it belongs to us to war and win this war come on and praise him with me this morning amen Ephesians 6 we love to read this this is good talks about the armor we got defensive warfare and we've got offensive warfare and therefore take up the whole armor of God, not just the part of it, but all of it, that you may be able to withstand the evil days and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded up your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you were able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We are to take the offensive tool, which is the Word of God. It empowers us. It restores us. It gives us what we need, all of the equipment that we need God has given to us so that we can win this war. Now let me tell you this, that you are in a warfare, as I have said. And this is where the enemy puts a trap on us. Listen. The war has already been won. Yeah. 
we do fight battles to occupy. Jesus said, occupy till I come. And we are here to occupy. When you send the army in, that's what they do. They take and occupy and hold it so that the enemy can't come back and take it. So we are to occupy and we have the weapons to do it with. But let me tell you, I want to say this to you. You're going to lose a battle every now and then. You're not going to win them all. Has anybody won every battle you fought in here? If you have, I want you to lay hands on me because I haven't. <laughs> no, you're going to lose some battles. But a key to that is don't stay there. Warriors, battle-armored people, get up and fight again. You have to get up and fight again. And the enemy wants to defeat you and take away your desire to win the battle. But as long as the Holy Spirit is in you, he's going to war, he's going to war, and he's going to war. And you cannot give up and give out just because you might lose a battle. I don't know why I thought that was important, but it is. So I'm going to say it to you this way. Don't waste your defeats. Don't waste them. When the enemy comes in, know that there is going to come greater strength. When I get through this, I'm going to come out stronger. I'm going to come out better. I'm going to come out more consecrated. I'm going to come out stronger than I went in. The enemy will not defeat me. I will go through this. I will enjoy overcoming the resistance of the devil. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Some of us, the enemy beats us up and we think, oh me, I can't hold out. I can't do it. I'm a weak warrior. I couldn't. I, I just don't seem to have the, oh Lord, I know you can't use me. Just kick me to the curve and get me under the bus and I'll get out of your way. Come on, church. We got to use that defeat and get up and remember that, that maturity brings, comes through difficulty. Maturity comes through difficulty. And we're, we all have our vulnerable places that we don't even know they're called blind sides until the enemy exposes them. And when he does, defeat him right there and get up and walk on. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. He studies you all the time. He works against you to find out where you are and where he can bring doubt and unbelief and get you to give up. Well, let's look. We, let me talk about what is, what is necessary. In the warfare, the first thing is always repentance. There must be repentance is fundamental. I was telling someone the other day, you know, I think of it this way, that every door swings on two hinges. And if you only have one hinge, the door won't swing. But if you want the door to swing for you, you got to have repentance and acceptance. It takes both. Just like getting saved, you got to repent and then you got to receive. You got takes both of those to work that door so it swings on. So I'm saying to you, always when you get into the warfare, repent. Can I hear that? What, what's the word? What's the first thing? Repent. And then the second thing, when you get through, go and lose this little battle, but knowing that the war, then go back and ask yourself, what did I learn and what am I going to do differently? And I mean, well, I fell, I had a, you know, I lied, I gossiped, I didn't mean to, I, I, I really didn't think I would do that. Then go back and say, why did I do that? There's something deeper than that. There's something you're trying to work through, cover up, get through. So look, that's your opportunity to dig a little deeper. Come Holy Spirit, take me a little deeper. What is it that is really bothering me here that would cause me to do that? Where is my frustration? What am I doing? Where was I my disappointment? Where is my hurt? Where is my ungodly belief? Where is my weakness? Show me, Lord, so I can not let him do that one again. I'm not going to go back there because there's always a fundamental weakness there that has to be dealt with. What did I learn and what will I do differently? And then what fundamental did I break? Where did the enemy get a hold of me? Where did he cause me to doubt? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I believe that? Where did that thought come from? You cannot dwell on the loss. I think about David at Ziglag. If anybody could have ever given up at a place, that would have been David at Ziglag. I mean, here he is. They went off, the, you know the story. They won the war. They won the battle. They came back, and while they were gone, they destroyed their, their whole camp, the headquarters, took their family, their children, their spoils, and took them off. And there they were. There was nothing left but a little smoking ember of where there was left. 
They had burned him out, taken everything and gone. And even his own men said, let's just kill him. There wasn't anything good except one thing. And David encouraged himself. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? I know that we have fought the battle. I know we're going to be winners. Something's not right here. What's going on? And he says, this must be right before the blessing. This must be right before the deliverance. This must be right before when God's going to deliver it. I must be right up against it. I must be about to break through. I'm not going to give up right here. I'm going to take on a new, a new authority. I'm going to go get it back. He encouraged himself, which meant he went back and remembered the fundamentals of who he was, why he was there, that this wasn't a battle, that he might lose this battle, but the war was already won in the kingdom, and God had already prophesied over him. God had already promised him, and he knew in that promise that he could be it would be fulfilled. Let me tell you, there's some of you are that close to your promise right now. You're just about a little bit more and you're going to be there. You're right up there pressing against it and you're saying, God, will I ever get to the other side? Am I, a, am I done? And the Lord says, push one more time. Just push one more time. Just do it one more time. Just try it. Oh, oh, oh. Ah. Push it on through. Ow! Praise you, you, you cannot dwell on your defeat. You cannot go introspective to the point that it's all about you. It's about the enemy coming against you. And that's what you've got to do. You can become self-focused. You know, today we worry about identity theft. That's all everybody wants to give you their software, their, their lockdown, lock up, set straight, do something. Get, get rid of identity so you won't be misidentified or stolen. That's what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to take your identity. He wants to take that which God's given you and say that's not who you are. You're not that person. But let me tell you, I am who Jesus said I am. I am who God says I am. I am victorious. I am, a, I am on the right track. Well, I want to bring this to a point, but I, I just always go back when I you know, when I get to that place sometimes where I need some encouragement. And it, I go back to where it says we're more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. Let me, let me put this up. We don't fight for a victory, but from a victory. You're not fighting for the victory. It's already been won. That has already been settled in the heavenly. It's done. Jesus is sitting there, just sitting there right there, the right hand of the Father, and he's just saying, go for it. You don't know you're about to make it. Go for it one more time because I've already won the victory. But I want to encourage you with those words this morning. Let's, we're going to look at Romans 8, 34 and through 39. Just, just listen to these beautiful words. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, as I told you, you are in a warfare. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's what the enemy accounts for, but that's not the way God has it planned. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded <laughs> that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come whew, can separate us from the love of God. I just, that is, there's nothing can separate you today from the love of God. It's, that was God's intention in the beginning, 
And that is fundamental that no matter what you've done or what you've said or how you did it, good or bad, nothing is separating you from the love of God. You know, we talk about where the lion is roaring like a... Let me tell you, the lion is going around toothfully, but let me tell you what, he's a lion on a leash. And, and God's got him on a leash and he's going to keep him there. He can only do so much. Now this morning, I really want us, I really feel that the Lord is saying, I was saying to the Lord, Lord, why don't we have, why, why don't we have all the money? Why do we have sickness and disease? I mean, we believe in the power of gifts. We believe in the, in the Word of God. We take the, the whole gospel. We are full gospel people. If it's in there and Jesus said it, we believe it and we do it. He said, we'll do it again. I said, all right, <laughs> we'll do it again. So I want you to stand to your feet. And this morning we're going to, we, we're going to, do, um, we're going to do just that. Now, first thing I said you always have to start with is repentance, okay? Let's start with repentance. And we're going to, get, we're going to have some repentance this morning. You're going to leave here changed. Did you hear? I said you're going to leave here changed. So, the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here today. He's done a work already, and he's going to finish his work before we leave here. Now, the first thing, let's go through re repentance. Now, I'll pray you can pray after me. Father, Father forgive, me forgive me for my doubt, for my, doubt my unbelief, my unbelief for, for allowing myself to uh, come under the attack of the enemy. Of the enemy. I now tell you to wash me. Cleanse me through the blood of Jesus. I confess my sin. Everything that's not according to your will is sin. And I confess to you that I want nothing in my life that would distract me from all that you have for me and through me. So I confess today that I have sinned, and forgive me of my sins, wash me and cleanse me, and I thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Now the second thing we want to do is we want to stop the enemy and claim our authority, okay? We're going to do that. Now, pray with me. Devil, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, I break your assignment, I break your attack, I call you an enemy of the cross. The, the, the Jesus has defeated you. He, you are, he held you up in display as a defeated foe. You know, have no, no, you have no power over me. I have confessed my sin. I'm under the blood of Jesus. I'm assigned by the Father. I'm equipped by the Holy Ghost. And I am a warrior. You are defeated. You leave me now. Vacate now. I have the victory. I'm claiming my authority. And you will go now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, all right, all right. Now, we're going to claim that authority this morning. Now, I want you to be seated for just a moment. If you're here this morning and you have a need in your body for some healing, I want you to stand up. Miracle healing, whatever it is. All right, looks like we need some Holy Ghost here this morning. Seems like we need the Holy Spirit to walk in here. And I'm, I'm going to pray over Dr. Mary. And I want you to receive it for yourself. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, she's, just a, she's just a point of reference. But this is so that, so that I won't have to, I say have to, cannot lay hands on each one of you. But I'll lay hands on her and just know that hands are being laid on you, okay, right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that your blood satisfied everything that was needed and by his stripes there we are all healed right now. I come against anything that comes against the cross of Christ. I declare that through the cross of Christ all healing is ours. I come against disease right now and I say in the name of Jesus, go from her body in Jesus' name. Every affliction that has come, across, come against this body, I proclaim it is against the will of Christ 
and it must go now in the name of Jesus. I declare that Jesus showed us miracles. He did miracles and he said we're to do miracles. So in the name of Jesus I lay hands and I declare a miracle this morning in Jesus name. And in the name of Jesus there's nothing can stop the miracle of God. We declare today that disease, infirmity, sickness, everything must leave her body. Everything is restored. Everything is reclaimed. It is reformed, restored, and, and renewed in Jesus' name. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I say miracle, 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 miracle. In the name of Jesus, come forth now in Jesus' name. Receive it. You receive it right now. Say, I receive it. I receive it in the name of Jesus. And I celebrate my healing. Oh, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Come on, come on and praise. Okay, you may be seated now. If you are working through a relationship, whether it's at your office or whether it's in your marriage or whether it's in your family, I want you to stand up. Now don't miss a miracle. Okay. See, we're all dealing with stuff. Everybody's got stuff in their life, right? I'm praying against stuff today. <laughs> Every bit of that stuff. <laughs> okay, give me, give me, give me, give me, come, brother, come, brother, Don, come on, Donald, brother, come, Donald. Huh? He's my, he's my point of reference. Okay, you are the recipient. He is the recipient. We're all recipients today. I, and I'm laying hands on him, but I'm laying hands on you. In the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of Christ, and through the finished and victorious work of Him, I declare that every relationship that the enemy has tried to come against, we right now put it and restore it back in Jesus' name. We come against any misunderstanding, any misrepresentation. We know, Father, that there are those in our family we know need restoring, Lord, that need to get saved today. We pray that the Holy Ghost will draw them right now in the name of Jesus, and that and that there will be restoration fellowship shall be restored disagreement shall be set up marriages will come back together old estranged and, and broken relationships shall be restored we say Holy Spirit come draw pull bind together those things and we say Holy Spirit send messengers out right now send out your angels send them out that they may do a work and be harvesters in the, in the kingdom of God right now so in the name of Jesus, I speak to every relationship and I say, be healed in Jesus' name. Be restored in Jesus' name. Be put back together in Jesus' name. We break misunderstanding, mistrust, and, and disagreement right now is broken in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And full restoration is brought back in the name of Jesus. We declare it. Now those standing say, I receive it. In the, name of Jesus. in the name of Jesus, it is mine, it is mine. I, declare it. I declare it, and it will happen, it will happen. By, faith. by faith, it will happen. It will happen. I, may it. I may not feel it, I may not see it right away, but I have received the prayer, received the prayer. And, it and it will happen, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Amen. amen, be seated and thank God. All right, anybody that is in need of a restoration, a miracle in your finances, I want you to stand. I guarantee you I can't lay hands on all of you. Woo, come on and let us know that the Holy Ghost is going to restore those things. Oh, come on, I just, I just feel the Holy Ghost is going to do it. Come on, Holy Ghost. Okay, give me a person right here. Somebody that feels, okay, I got him. He, 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 he needs an overhaul. <laughs> How many? All right, let's, let's extend your hand toward him. That's your connecting point to yourself. That's All of you are standing, and I don't see very many seated. So I'm going to say this to you. 
Just claim it for yourself right now this morning. The prayer of restoration over him in the name of Jesus. Right now in the name of Jesus, I take authority against you, devil, and your assignment over every one of our finances. I break your, your assignment right now in the name of Jesus. I declare that Jesus is ruler over my life and that all the finances that he has set apart, you must release them right now in the name of Jesus. You can no longer hold those finances, those monies, those those treasures that have been set up for me, I call them in right now and I say, devil, take your hands off my money. Take your hands off my asset. Take your hands off my wealth. You cannot have it. You are destroyed, defeated right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare my finances will come in. You will send people with favor. You will release amazing uh, uh, monies releases. You will make right connections. You will send clients. You will send customers. You will send and opportunity you will set up arrangements that there will be a flow of money I say there will be forgiveness of debt lowering debt things that have been done will be wiped out those things that have come against me will be wiped out and I declare that I walk in the full restoration of my finances and I declare that I am not I may be broke but I'm not poor so Lord I tell you what I want to be put back in where I'm not broke in Jesus name and Lord where it's broke you can fix it so I say Lord fix it in the name of Jesus and I declare that we will prosper according to the word of God and that as our soul prosper so shall our bank accounts prosper this morning we declare for breakthrough in Jesus name amen all right thank you I want you to declare with me I declare that finances have been set free. I am no longer under bondage. I call it in. I call the thief and robber who he is. He must release his assignment and let those things flow to me that are rightfully mine. In Jesus' name. Why don't you give the Lord a hand again? Anything else? You got anything? Okay. Okay, you are clean and ready to go out there and put on your weapons of warfare. Get out your sword. Put on your blessed plate of righteousness. Gird your, lo your loins with truth. Put on your shod your feet with peace. And grab up your helmet of salvation and get out there and fight. In the name of Jesus. Come on, one more applause to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.